The basal ganglia is an area in the brain located deep within the cerebral hemispheres. It consists of the striatum, the globus pallidus, the thalamus, the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. It is heavily connected with the frontal areas and interacts with different levels of the sensory motor hierarchy. The primary function of the basal ganglia is to provide a feedback mechanism to the cerebral cortex for the initiation and control of motor responses. Most of the output of the basal ganglia, which is mediated through the thalamus, is to dampen an excitatory input to the cerebral cortex. Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative disease, normally presenting in older patients. It is caused by selective atrophy of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, specifically the pars compactor. Inhibitory activity along the direct pathway is reduced, resulting in increased inhibition from the globus pallidus to the thalamus. This leads to reduction in cortical activity and movement. There are four main motor symptoms most common in patients. Bradykinesia, which refers to slowness of movement and encompasses difficulties with planning, initiating and executing movement and performing tasks. Tremor, which is characterised by involuntary, rhythmic and alternating movements of body parts. Tremors can occur at rest, during postural maintenance or during voluntary movements. Rigidity, which is where there is a resistance present through the range of passive movement of a limb, often associated with pain. It can also cause postural deformities such as extreme neck flexion, truncal flexion and scoliosis. Postural instability, which is caused by loss of postural reflexes due to loss of integration of visual, vestibular and proprioceptive input. This often leads to falls and is usually one of the later symptoms. All of these can have devastating impacts on a person's functioning, but what can we do? Pharmacotherapy is a key method used to treat Parkinson's. There are no disease modification drugs, but treatments can be used to ease symptoms. The most common drug treatments are levodopa based. Dopamine itself is unable to cross a blood brain barrier, so cannot be directly used to treat Parkinson's. However, levodopa, which is the precursor to dopamine in the dopamine synthesis pathway, can cross the blood brain barrier. It is then converted to dopamine by dopa decarboxylase. While levodopa is effective, the side effects can be major. Some of these side effects are caused by the conversion of levodopa to dopamine outside the CNS by dopa decarboxylase. These are minimised by administering peripheral inhibitors of dopa decarboxylase alongside levodopa. Prolonged use can result in dyskinesias. Dyskinesias of involuntary twisting movements. They usually occur when the drugs at peak dose. It can also result in severe on-off fluctuations in motor control. Rapid wearing off of the drug leaves the patient with severe Parkinsonian symptoms after previous high functioning. An alternative to levodopa treatments is to use dopamine agonist drugs. Dopamine agonist drugs bind to the dopaminergic receptors, so do not need to be converted to dopamine. While the side effects are less crippling, dopamine agonists can cause patients to develop impulse control disorders such as gambling addiction, binge eating and hypersexuality. In addition, certain patients can undergo deep brain stimulation therapy to minimise symptoms. This involves implanting an electrode into either the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus internus, which provides constant electrical stimulation. The subthalamic nucleus is a glutamatergic nucleus in the basal ganglia. Most of the time, the cells are inactive from constant inhibition by cells in the external pallidal segment. In patients with Parkinson's, this inhibition is removed, causing high levels of activity and therefore a motor deficit. The globus pallidus internus is a wedge-shaped nucleus, which is one of the main inhibitory output centres of the motor circuit. Deep brain stimulation therapy is effective in reducing motor symptoms while patients are in the off-medication phase. However, it is very invasive and not suitable for patients who are older or have dementia. As Parkinson's is a movement disorder, physical rehabilitation plays a key role in improving symptoms. However, there are no clear guidelines on what the most appropriate therapy is. In the early phases of Parkinson's, the main goals of physiotherapy tend to be preventative ones, including prevention of inactivity, fear of moving and fear of falling. As the disease progresses, focus tends to be on improving body posture, reaching and grasping, balance and gait. This, however, can be done in different ways. For example, resistance training has been shown to improve motor symptoms over a two-year period. Yoga, dance and Tai Chi also appear to improve motor function and postural stability. In order to effectively prescribe a physical therapy, we need to know how this is going to improve motor function. It is widely believed that neuroplasticity-based therapies for Parkinson's are unavailable, so the function of physical therapy, much like drug treatment, is just to slow down decline. Data suggests that physical activity must be self-produced with heightened arousal to be able to change brain architecture and function. This is supported by a study where the basal ganglia in mice had been lesioned, which found that high-intensity treadmill exercise is neurorestorative. This may indicate that the current focus on physiotherapy treatment is insufficient to improve brain plasticity as exercise needs to be high intensity. Fischer et al. found that high intensity treadmill training, with appropriate support from a harness, improved gait strategy and performance in Parkinson's patients when compared to standard physiotherapy and no training. More interestingly, they found that cortical excitability improved compared to baseline and control groups. 
However, it must be noted that no statistical tests were performed, so this just indicates a trend rather than any real difference. There was also only a small sample size and large variability in both severity of disease and dosage of drugs they were taking. They then followed this up with a small pilot study looking at four Parkinson's patients not on drug treatments and two healthy controls. Two patients with Parkinson's and the two controls underwent eight weeks of intensive treadmill exercise for three one-hour sessions per week at progressively increasing speeds. Using a PET scan combined with MRI imaging, dopamine D2 receptor binding potential was measured using a tracer. This shows changes in both the amount of receptors and the sensitivity. Exercise led to an 81 and 98% increase in binding potential in Parkinson's patients, compared to no increase in those without exercise. This appears to be specific to Parkinson's as only a slight increase is observed in the healthy controls. This may be important as D2 receptors are inhibitory and an important source of corticostriatal glutaminergic input modulation. This study also shows that treadmill training is able to improve postural control but not overall scores on an assessment of severity of Parkinson's. This is particularly interesting as previous research suggests that there isn't a carryover from a learned task to another. In this may be due to patients working at higher exercise intensity which isn't typical of Parkinson's therapies. These higher intensities are required to trigger D2 changes before task transfer can occur. However, this is again limited by the small sample size, so future research should look to replicate these findings in an RCT. Semital found that training using a whole body dynamic balancing task for six weeks significantly altered bone grey matter volume in early to mid-stage Parkinson's patients. The balance training involved keeping a movable platform horizontal which was measured by the time participants were able to keep the board horizontal plus or minus 5 degrees. Performance over the six weeks improved in the task and there was a significant correlation of growing matter volume increases and performance increases, providing evidence that brain plasticity is a consequence of skill acquisition. During weeks one and two, Parkinson's patients showed grey matter volume increases within the left parietal cortex, which were transient and decreased during weeks three and four of training, suggesting the importance of the area during early learning. In weeks three and four, volume increases were seen in the left cerebellum and the right inferior temporal gyrus. This is important as they are part of a structurally connected, lateralised parietal basal ganglia circuitry network, which, when disrupted in Parkinson's patients, are associated with performance problems with dual task interference. The only area which correlated with performance in healthy controls was the left hippocampus. These findings therefore suggest that Parkinson's patients may rely on enhanced sensory processing, particularly in the early stages of learning, which leads to increased structural plasticity. There was no increase in grey matter during weeks 5 and 6, which suggests that plasticity only occurs when there is large improvements in performance. In order to implement this as a strategy in physical therapy, research should focus on whether further training, either with a different balance training method or with a different skill, like throwing or catching, can continue to facilitate structural changes, and if this could affect symptom onset. Exercise can influence neurotrophin levels in Parkinson's patients. Serum levels of neurotrophins, including glyocell line-derived neurotrophic factors, or GDNF, and brain-derived neurotrophic factors, or BDNF, regulate the survival and activity of dopaminergic neurons and can prevent neuron death and degeneration. Zolads et al. found that moderate intensity interval training three times a week for eight weeks involving cycling above a self-selected pace improved clinical status of Parkinson's disease. The training resulted in an increase of the basal serum BDNF levels by 34% and decreased inflammation. This was followed up by Maruzi Akatal, who found that high intensity cycling interval training increased serum BDNF levels in Parkinson's patients but no increase in a healthy control group. They found reduced rigidity, stiffness in the biceps brachii and and tremor frequency, all of which correlate with the increased serum BDNF. This suggests that high intensity interval training increases neuroplasticity in the basal ganglia. However, both studies had small sample sizes, so again, this should be replicated in RCT. Typical treatment strategies in the early stages of Parkinson's mainly involve providing information and it's about staying active. Since those with Parkinson's are less likely to be doing higher intensity exercise, which seems to be required to increase plasticity, this might be insufficient. More research will need to be done to find the exercise modality that will induce plasticity and confirm that this is caused by the exercise. If an exercise programme is able to provide benefits in terms of neuroplasticity, then drug treatments can be delayed. We also need to find out whether these exercise programmes can have a positive effect on symptoms and neuroplasticity in later stages of disease. The research is focused on early stages of Parkinson's. However, if an exercise programme can alleviate symptoms in the later stages, then this may help reduce reliance on drugs and surgery. It also will inform whether it's how important it is to catch Parkinson's early, because if it can only be treated in the early stages, then early identification is vital. 
It would also be valuable to know whether exercise can provide a degree of protection from Parkinson's disease. Research has shown that cigarette smoking does have a protective effect against Parkinson's, with an inverse correlation between smoking and Parkinson's incidences. The reason for this is not fully understood, but may be because nicotine activates certain acetylcholine receptors, which have been shown to be neuroprotective. Of course, we can't recommend people start smoking, as this brings a whole host of other negative health effects. If exercise can provide a similar benefit, this is preferable, as is better for overall health. There is some evidence that does show that better physical fitness is associated with lower incidences of Parkinson's. However, it is not clear whether age of exercise program initiation matters or what the mechanisms are. 